without further ado, um, I'm Jillian uh, and I am actually a certified sommelier. So people often ask, what does that mean? What is a sommelier? Um, a, som a som or a sommelier is a, uh, a certified wine expert by the Court of Master Sommeliers. So there's four levels of psalms, ma master being the fourth, the highest level. Um, there are actually fewer master psalms in the world than there are major league baseball players. So it's a very small group of individuals who um, are basically walking encyclopedias of wine. Um, I am not a master, but I'm, I'm on my way, uh, though I, I think I have some years ahead of me in terms of studying and drinking lots of wine. Um, but there's a great documentary um, called Psalm uh, that, that details the process of becoming a master Psalm if it's something you're interested in. And they have a couple of other documentaries as well that go more into detail about the winemaking process and lots of other fun narratives around the wine industry. So I highly recommend those if anyone's looking for further resources. Um, tonight's agenda, we're gonna talk basically through the, the Wine 101. So we'll do winemaking 101, talk about how wine is made and grown. We'll do wine tasting, talk about some principles of what to look for in a wine. We'll do some flavor profile pairings and talking about what you might expect from specific grape varietals, um, some pairing rules and ways to work wine with food, and then um, we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. So um, we'll start with those wine 101s. So first of all, wine is really at its root an agricultural product. It's grapes being grown and turned into a good. Um, though there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of cultural significance around wine, that is really at the core of what it is. Um, and it comes into play from the very start of the wine making process all the way through where wine is sold, how it's packaged and labeled. It really depends on where it's from. Um, and there's this concept in the wine world called terroir, which means the, the taste of place. It's really um, the concept of wine tasting like where it's from and only like where it's from. So it has to do a lot with the way that the wine is farmed, the way that the techniques are used to grow it, um, the winemaker's preferences and the market for selling it. Um, and it all sort of comes to be in this concept called terroir. So um, wine can actually grow in all climates anywhere in the world. Um, it there's a, a couple of different denominations around where wine um, can be grown. The old world is considered pretty much just um, continental Europe. So places like Italy, France, Spain, um, where they've grown the oldest vines, grown for the longest amount of time. And then there's the new world, which is places like the US, South Africa, South America, um, Australia, New Zealand, um, anywhere that's a little bit newer to the wine world, um, a little bit less developed. So, um, but you can grow wine in warm climates, in uh, maritime climates, in mountainous climates. You can grow wine in Canada. When it freezes, it becomes ice wine. Um, there's lots of different wine techniques and lots of different ways to, to produce wine. And that's sort of what makes the market so diverse and what makes the product so interesting to study and to experience. Um, so all of those sort of the weather and the soil, the conditions um, all really contribute to the flavor of the wine. And that's what gives each different location, each vineyard, its own specific um, characteristics that make wine either um, specific varietals grow really well or make um, the wine better or worse or more interesting. It all sort of comes to be in, in the wine. Um, I'm just gonna ask everyone to mute if you're um, if you're not muted. Um, so moving on, the winemaking process is really in three steps. First, there's the harvest. So the grapes grow. If you've ever been so lucky to visit a vineyard, they grow in these beautifully manicured um, vines in rows. Um, lots of sunlight does them very well. Um, they are picked once they're mature, usually sometime in the fall, they're picked, they are sorted into good grapes and bad grapes. Um, they're pressed so that all of the juice is extracted. And then if it's white wine, they remove all of the skins of the grapes, all the stems and leaves. If it's red grapes, they let the skins remain with the juice. That's actually what gives red wine its color is the, the skins. Um, 
the wine then goes into the fermentation process. This often takes place in really large um, vats, often steel. Um, they add yeast to the juice, which then turns the natural sugar in grape juice into alcohol. So if you wanted to take, you know, Welch's grape juice, add some yeast and let it sit, it would probably turn into some kind of wine. Whether or not you want it to, you want to drink it is up to you. Um, but those are really the core principles of what, what's happening. Um, wine is then filtered and laned to age. So often wine is aged for either a really short period, it can be a couple of weeks, it can be all the way through months to years when, when the wine is aged in a barrel um, or sometimes with white wine in a steel tank or in, um, in a clay tank, lots of different mechanisms for storing the wine during the aging process. Um, it's then bottled after the certain amount of years, it's then either aged again in the bottle or it's sent right to the store and ready to drink, um, or you can age it on your own at home. The only exception to that process is sparkling wine, which undergoes a secondary fermentation. Um, it uh, produces ex excess carbon dioxide, which is what gives it that fizzy nature. Um, there's three different methods to produce sparkling wine. There's the champagne method or the traditional method. Um, I don't know if people know this, but for sparkling wine to be called champagne, it actually has to be grown in the champagne region in France. So there's a lot of sort of strict rules around that, which we'll touch on a little later when we go through old versus new world wines. Um, but that's, that method is pretty unique to the champagne region. Um, it undergoes the secondary fermentation in the bottles themselves. Um, versus the Charmat or tank method is widely used in making Prosecco, which is from the Prosecco region of Italy, a little bit more affordable than Champagne. Um, and that's done at a larger scale secondary fermentation. They do it in a large tank. Um, and the third method is carbonation, where just like taking any flat beverage, you in inject carbon dioxide and you end up with something sparkling. You can do the same thing with flat wine and just turn it sparkling by injecting that gas. Um, that's usually done with some pretty um, inexpensive bottles, things like Andre, um, that might be sort of a, a super affordable market option. Um, they often use that carbonation method. Um, and there's a bunch of different varieties in terms of flavor profile of champagne as well, um, ranging from sweet to dry. There's brut, which is on the sweeter end, extra brut, which is somewhere in the middle, and dry. Dry in the wine world really refers to no residual sugar after fermentation. So there wouldn't be any excess of sugar remaining that didn't convert to alcohol. Um, so that's really where the dry comes out. Just because it's dry doesn't mean the flavor won't be fruity or sweet or fruit forward. It will just be, um, there's no additional sugar in the actual wine itself. So tasting wine, um, and again, feel free to ask questions as we're going. If anything comes to mind, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, on the left of, the, of my screen is what we call the deductive tasting format. This is a grid that Psalms walk through as they're tasting wine often blindly, so they don't know what they're drinking. Um, they just have to figure it out as they go. Um, and it walks through the different senses and the sensory experiences of trying the wine. So I like to call them the five S's. They're easier to remember than they are on that grid. Um, the first is swirl. It's really using uh, the glass to move the wine around, to oxidize it, to see if anything changes, but also to see um, the, when you swirl the wine, it hits the sort of upper rim of the glass and then will eventually drip back down to the middle seeing how fast that happens and what the tears look like or the legs of the wine is actually indicative of the alcohol content of the wine itself. So the longer it takes to drip down, um, the longer the legs they say or the tears, the, the higher in alcohol content it is. Um, the second sense is sight. So using your eyes to look at the color, the brightness, the clarity of the wine. If it's red wine, does it seem really concentrated in the center of the glass with maybe a clearer rim? Um, is there sediment in the wine? That could be indicative of aging, um, things like that. So you can get a sense of what varietal it is based on the color. The third sense is smell. So you would swirl the wine, take a big smell. If anyone has a glass with them, feel free to follow along. 
Um, take a big whiff, see what comes to your nose first. Is it earth? Is it fruit? Um, is it, does it smell musty? Maybe like it's been aged. Can you smell toasted vanilla? That might be a sign that it's been oaked. Things like that really help give you an initial take at what kind of wine it might be, what kind of flavors you might expect on the palate. And then you, of course, get to drink the wine. Um, and the sip, you're looking as well at those sort of earth fruit flavors. What are you hit with first? As well as, is it balanced? And then there are a couple of more sensational feelings that you can get on the palate. So things like acid, which you actually feel in your salivary glands underneath your, um, underneath your mouth. And then the tannins, which is really only prevalent in red wine. And that's something you experience on your tongue. If your tongue starts to feel really dry, um, like you're ready to have a sip of water or another sip of wine, that's probably tannins. Um, and those are, they come from the breakdown of the grape skin. Uh, so the red wine, again, really is the only wine that has contact with the skins, hence why they're the only wines with tannins. Um, but the tannins uh, actually help sort of compose the body of the wine and they break down over time. So that's why some wines that have um, more, a more tannic flavor or more tannins that need a longer to break down do better with age. They're too dry when they're young. Uh, and then the final sense is swallowing. So once you swallow that sip, what, what is your palate left with? What's the finish? Is it drying? Is it bright? Um, do you feel like you have a very lasting flavor in your mouth or does it immediately go away? Is it has a short finish? Things like that can really also help give you a sense of not only what you're drinking, but whether you're enjoying drinking it. And that to me is really the key. Uh, a lot of people ask me as a psalm, you know, what's your favorite wine or what should I be drinking? And there are, of course, wines that I can recommend, but it's really all about understanding what you like, how you interact as a, your palate, what you enjoy, what flavors resonate with you. If you're someone who likes sweeter wines, and fruitier wines, you probably won't like a drier wine or a more earth forward wine and so on. So a lot of it is trying wines, which is always fun, doing a tasting and seeing what you like and then going from there in terms of developing your palate and then branching out uh, to try new wines as well. So as I alluded to earlier, there's two sort of big thought leaders in terms of the wine world. There's the old world and the new world. And they have very different styles in terms of wine production, wine growing, um, wine marketing, um, the laws around making wine. It's really um, apples and oranges when you're comparing them. And the fun part is that they grow a lot of the same grapes. So you get to actually experience an old world Pinot Noir and a new world Pinot Noir and see right in your glass what the differences are. Um, so old world, as I mentioned, is continental Europe, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, the oldest countries in the world to be producing wine and all of the grapes that grow around the rest of the world are actually directly related to those original vines. Um, so the oldest vines in the world are in the old world, makes sense. Um, they are the, also the original system and they really like to take pride in their rules. Uh, they have an old school way of producing wine. There's no irrigations, so there's no watering, um, there's no machinery, everything is done by hand. Uh, it's very sort of old school in that way. Um, they often are earth forward. So if you're tasting two of the exact same varietals and one smells like dirt and one smells like raspberries, chances are the dirt is the old world, the raspberries is the new, sort of a good trick. Um, and the old world wines are designed to age. They, they don't sort of age them on your behalf. They're going to sell them young and then you age them in your own cellar for, uh, you know, anywhere from two to 20 years. Um, and they have very little intervention, as I said, and very strict rules. So as I mentioned with champagne, for something to be called champagne, it has to be grown in champagne, bottled on the premise of the chateau, and uh, follow a couple of other sort of rules and regulations around that process to actually be called champagne to have that prestige on the label. Um, and they have things called DOCs or AOCs, depending on the country, uh, that are similar regulations around the region. So, you know, to say that your wine is a Sancerre from the Loire Valley, it has to sort of meet a couple of criteria and display a couple of things on the label for it to be qualified as that caliber of wine. Uh, and that also is attributed in the blending rules. So 
old world wines to be called a single varietal. So let's call it a Chardonnay. They have to actually be close to 100% of that Chardonnay grape. Whereas in the new world, wines can often be closer to 75% of that varietal and still only be disclosed as Chardonnay, even though 25% of that wine might be a bunch of other grapes. Um, so on the flip side, the new world has a lot less rules and regulations. They're a lot more innovative because of it. Um, but the countries include the US, Australia, South Africa, South America, really anywhere that isn't continental Europe. Um, and then the, again, descendants from the original vines, a lot more fruit forward in terms of flavor. You might um, taste them as sweeter wines. They're often bolder, a little bit more fruit forward. Um, experiencing things more like, you know, cherry or raspberry or plum or lime and lemon, um, floral notes as well. Um, they're a little bit bolder. Often wine experts sort of attribute that to the market itself. Americans, we have a, a fattier diet with a lot more diversity of flavor um, and we need a lot more sort of powerful, flavorful wines to really compete there. Um, they're designed to drink now. We are apparently an impatient group, um, and so they're not as designed to age or to sit for time in your cellar. Um, and they're more experimental. There's less regulation, higher levels of consistency. There's not, because they're a little bit more regulated in terms of how they're made, you can expect a similar wine from year to year. Um, and there's more blending for that reason as well. So those are really the main differences. And then when you're tasting wines, the old and new world have impacts as well. So on the left is what we call an aroma wheel, and it goes through a bunch of different flavors that you might smell or taste or experience in wine. Psalms will really liken the flavor of wine to anything. Um, I've heard people use the term fresh tennis balls, um, new garden hose, fresh mowed grass, um, flavors that you may have actually never tasted, but have some sort of association with and therefore can sort of experience in the wine. So I'm certainly never going to tell you that what you're tasting in wine is not there um, because it's really just, um, it's just up to you. Um, old world wines tend to be, as I said, fruit forward. Um, new world, oh, sorry, old world is earth forward and new world is fruit. Um, some of those flavors could be, you know, fruit would be red fruit, things like strawberries, raspberries. Um, there might be, you know, some tropical fruits, pineapple, mango, lychee. Um, I'm looking at the aroma wheel for some inspiration. Dried fruits, things like raisins and figs. Fruitcake is even on here. Citrus, excuse me, of course. Um, and then more herbal, there's some floral notes. Um, and then things like, um, microbial flavors, mushrooms, sourdough, butter and cream, things you might get in a Chardonnay, especially that dairy flavor, vegetal, um, spices, leather, you know, some animal flavors. There's lots of different uh, flavors involved in, in the wine aroma wheel. Um, and again, that sort of acid and tannic sensation, those are more feelings versus flavors, but things to also register as you're sort of tasting wines as you go. And then the body of wines also really come out in the experience of the smell and of the taste. Are they full bodied, medium bodied or lighter? And that's really um, con contributed to by the grape varietals itself and the style of wine that, that the winemaker is going for often. New World wines tend to be super full and bodied. There's nothing sort of bigger than a, a California Cabernet Sauvignon, really sort of jammy, fruit forward, bold. Um, and then there's lighter red wines and of course lighter white wines that, um, that might sort of be able to stand up to some lighter foods. They don't quite match a steak or something quite as fatty, but they, they certainly have their own place. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about pairings in a few minutes. Um, someone asked how long you can generally store New World wines. Um, that's a great question, and it really does depend on the grape varietal itself. Often red wines can age for longer than white because they do have those tannins to protect them. Um, and I would say, you know, anywhere from with a white wine, you want to drink it maybe within five to seven years, if not sooner. Things like Chardonnay can generally stand up to age a little bit better than some of the other white wines. Those are 
usually designed to drink pretty quickly. Rosé is designed, you know, to drink right away. They, those are not designed to age at all. And then red wines can really go anywhere, I would say, from, you know, five years for some all the way through 35 years. Um, and I would say if you're aging something for longer than five years, it's really about making sure it's in a consistent environment that it has that sort of um, steady temperature, a little bit of a chill on it so that it, it doesn't um, it doesn't rot or, or get tampered with. If we go back to sort of the first thing I said about wine really being a living product, you want to store something almost like in the refrigerator for, for years and years, not that cold, uh, but a basement is a really good place for wines to be stored in that it's a consistent cool temperature, it's moist um, and, and has little humidity. Those are environments that wine really does quite well in for, for years on end. All right, so moving on to the flavor profiles. So this is the fun part. So when you go to the store or you go to a restaurant and you're trying to find a bottle of wine, it's often, you know, you've absolutely no concept for what it's gonna taste like uh, when you open it up. And it's not like you can always sample it on, in the store. You know, you have to commit to that full bottle. So depending on what it costs, it can be a pretty big commitment. So a few of the sort of varietals to think through and to do sort of a self-assessment with in terms of your own wine preferences and your palate. Um, with white wine, there are sort of two schools of thought. There's the sweet and the savory. And again, that, that speaks to old and new world, but also a little bit to the grape varietals themselves. So some of those sweet flavors are things like, you know, the fruit forward citrus flavors, the floral flavors, um, tropical fruit, Sauvignon Blanc, for example, is um, always sort of likened to taste like passion fruit, especially the new world varietals from, um, from Marlborough and other New Zealand growers. Um, and then there's the off dry. And that means that there might be a little bit of residual sugar, but it also might give you just really that sweet mouthfeel, something like honey, apple, pear, those tend to produce sort of a sweeter fruit forward flavor profile. And then there's the savory side. That's sort of the earthy and oaky. Um, there's some herbs, a little bit of moss or nuts, uh, the dairy flavor that's generally only likened to Chardonnay, and that's from a, yet another secondary fermentation uh, called malolactic fermentation. It's a reaction between Chardonnay and aging it in oak. It generally takes on that really vanilla sort of oaked flavor, which is also attributed to that sort of dairy, that buttery flavor um, that it gets from being oaked. So sort of a reaction between that specific grape and oak. Often it's designed to happen that way. Um, it's a choice that the winemaker might make without oaking Chardonnay. It's, it's actually a really neutral grape. So some common white grape varietals, uh, Chardonnay, as I just mentioned, Sauvignon Blanc, and they're sort of the, again, old and new world style. Sancerre is Sauvignon Blanc from the old world and Sauvignon Blanc from the new world has that super tropical fruit, really what I think of as Sauvignon Blanc flavor. Um, it's pretty unique. Uh, there's Riesling, there's Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio, Pinot Gris being the French style, Pinot Grigio being the Italian, um, Semillon, there's a bunch of different white varietals um, with lots of different flavor profiles and, and sort of something for everyone along the lines of lighter to full bodied, along the lines of fruit forward and earth fry as well in the middle. And then likewise for the red wines, there's the sweet and the savory. Um, sweet red wines tend to be fruit forward, but more in sort of the, the red or black berry family or the stone fruit family. So things like plums, um, cherries, that, that sort of niche of the aroma wheel. Uh, and then on the savory side, there's often that really dry and tannic mouthfeel, um, again, that you get from oak uh, and from aging. And then from the savory family as well, there's that earthy and oak um, dirt, meat, leather family of flavors. And then there's the vegetal family, um, that sort of bell pepper, jalapeno, um, Cabernet Franc actually smells exactly like bell pepper. Um, it's not often produced as a solo varietal, so it's often blended into other things, but um, when it's not blended, it's a really fun uh, glass to put your nose into because it smells exactly like cutting open a bell pepper. And then some common varietals in the red wine world, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, Merlot, um, to name a few. And again, tons more to, to try. 
Any other questions before we jump into the pairing rules? No? Okay, move right along. Um, so, some pairing rules when it comes to wine. And these are really just guidelines. They're not hard, fast rules but they really help bring out the best in the wine and in the food. Obviously, if you're cooking or if you're going out to a nice meal, the worst thing you could do is um, overpower your food with a really full-bodied wine or vice versa, overpower your wine with a really heavy food and not sort of give them the opportunity to shine equally. So that's where these guidelines come in. Um, one being like with like, so salty food with a high salinity wine, the flavors really melt nicely and can sort of suit each other, bringing out that flavor in each. So an example being um, a Chablis, let's say from the Loire Valley, um, sort of a varietal of Chardonnay from France might be really great with an oyster. That's a really sort of saline fish. Um, you're, it tastes a little bit like the sea. Um, and it can be helpful to sort of drink it with something really high in acidity, something from a maritime climate um, that can really sort of stand up to that salty flavor, not get overpowered, anything too light, and all you're going to taste is salt. Um, likewise, things that are grown together go together. So Italian food with Italian wine, um, nothing better than, you know, a Montepulciano with a red sauce. Um, they just really bring out the best in each other, and that's not even just in Italian, in, in, in Italian cuisine, um, but likewise with, you know, um, a German Riesling tends to go really well with like a schnitzel or something a little bit fattier food from that area. Um, and they're designed that way when they decide what to produce way, way back in the, in the day uh, when these vines were originally planted, they were designing wines to, to go with what they were eating and people weren't transporting food you know, internationally, they weren't trying international cuisines. It was really the local food and their, their local um, fare. So they were, you know, pairing naturally and that sort of has how both the wine and the foods have evolved together. Um, so it's a great sort of rule to stick to where things are, are grown and they're, they're probably gonna meld well. Third, we have opposites attract. So um, this one's a fun one to try. It's almost like putting M&Ms in your popcorn. It sounds really gross and then it actually works perfectly. Uh, so that's sort of something uh, on the sweeter side in the wine to something spicier in the food, almost like having a glass of milk with a really spicy dish. They just sort of, it counteracts each other in a really soothing way. Um, so I would recommend an off dry Riesling or a Gewürztraminer or something with a little bit of fruit a little bit of sugar in it with something like a Thai curry where it can really stand up to that punchy spicy flavor. Um, and the same thing with something sweeter, with something saltier. That's why, um, you know, a sauterne or an after dinner wine goes really nicely with a cheese plate with some blue cheese, something really salty um, that can stand up to that sweeter flavor. And then balance. And this is really the original rule of making sure that both can really stand up to one another and to shine. Um, heavy foods really do need a heavier wine, not only because of overpowering one another, but just to really make sure that, you know, when you're drinking a, a Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, a really full bodied wine, it doesn't, it's not, you're not doing it justice by drinking it on its own. It actually will taste better with food, even if it's a cracker and cheese or something light like um, a, a charcuterie board or going all the way to like a, a grilled steak or a burger, something that can really help bring out its flavors. And food often has that really magic quality with wine. Um, so it's, it's sort of finding that perfect match. And then lighter foods often need something lighter so that they don't overpower the food. So that's sort of where that white wine with fish and chicken and then red wine with red meat comes into play. Um, there are some exceptions, of course, to that rule, um, but when it comes to fish, I would highly recommend going with something in the white wine family. And I think that's really all that, that's on my agenda. I'm happy to answer any other questions. If anyone has any, feel free to um, shoot me an email. My, my contact information is also on my website, which is somepeoplesay.com. If you have any additional questions, I'm more than happy to to keep talking about wine, I could talk about wine all night long. Kind of a silly pairing question. 
Sure. Okay. A lot of nights I'll have popcorn for dinner and I want mm -hmm. wine with it. And I yeah. do have a house, but what works best with popcorn? It's a great question. Buttered, buttered popcorn, not yeah. not candy. So what, we can sort of go through the exercise of the grid I just showed. Mm -hmm. I, the first thing that came to my mind is Chardonnay, a super buttery Chardonnay that would, you know, has that sort of same buttered flavor, buttered popcorn. On the flip side, I actually think a Pinot Noir could be really interesting with it. They often have a more vanilla oak flavor. Um, and I think that could pair really well with like a salty popcorn. And then anything really crisp. So like rosé is a really great example. A Provence-based Provence rosé is really acidic, a little fruity and light. Uh, certainly would not be overpowered by a popcorn, but um, could sort of be a fun summer treat. Great, thank you. Of course. Yeah. Well, I encourage everyone to pop the cork and uh, and try wine. I really think the best way to learn not only about wine, but also about what you like is really just to keep trying different wines. It's easy to get in a routine of having the same varietal or the same bottle that you know is your go-to, but um, the fun is really in trying new flavors. And often your local wine store would be able to recommend something if you're you know, a diehard Chardonnay person and you're looking to branch out, they'd probably have some recommendations for you around, um, around new options that are similar, but, but not all the same. And again, if anyone has more questions, please feel free to reach out.